I have a question, though, that I want to ask. Maybe you've asked this question before of yourself. Who am I? And what was I created to do? This is the question that we see Paul answering for us today for himself. It's a question that as we read this text today, I pray that you wrestle with, that you can find some conclusion in, some strength and uh, solidification when you answer the question, who am I and what was I created to do? And if you've been following along, along with us in the book of Ephesians, I think the answer is clear. We are significant in God's sight. Uh, he has bestowed upon the riches of his grace, the, the mercy that goes beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. We won't get to that section yet today, but it's at the end of chapter 3. I, I, my guess is that most of us have asked this question of who am I? What was I created to do? And it's likely that some of us, <clears throat> most of us, have found satisfaction in a job or a role within a family or a pursuit of something on the side, something that we're passionate about. And there's a likelihood that even in that, the question still creeps in and sometimes crowds out all other thoughts. Who am I? What was I created to do? At times, the answers seem to be elusive or filled with what Paul uses here in this text, the word mystery. If you fall into a younger demographic, it might seem impossible or overwhelming to try to discover it. There's so much pressure. Getting ready to graduate high school, you're pursuing, like, everybody's asking, what are you going to do when you go to college? What are you going to be when you grow up? And that question comes, who am I? And what am I going to do? <laughs> what was I created to do? As middle-aged individuals, we might look back and say, have I missed it? Do I really know who I am? And have I been accomplishing what I was created to do? And if you're in the golden years and you've looked back and you've said, have I really accomplished it? Because I'm not sure I even know the answer yet. And I'm in towards the twilight years of life. And yet the questions still ask. It still seems elusive. It still seems like a mystery. But today, we're going to look at what Paul says about his life. I believe we're going to see some places that we can identify with Paul's life. And I believe that regardless of what your occupation is, what time you, uh, what you do spending your time, you'll be able to see exactly and clearly who you are and what you were created to do, your purpose. That's where we're headed. <clears throat> in chapter 3, um, we see these words uh, for this reason, chapter 3, verse 1. But before we get to the rest of chapter 3, what we just listened to, we have to take a running start because in, in some texts, there's this bridging gap uh, the, for this reason. What does that mean, for this reason? Well, Paul has said some very significant things in chapter 2, and if you were here with us last week, you may recall those things, but if you weren't, just real quick, we see last week that God has come to tear down the walls of hostility. He's broken down the barriers between Jews and Gentiles, and he has created for himself one people. We mentioned last week that in God, plural becomes singular. Verse 17 of chapter 2 states specifically, he came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near, two audiences, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And for this reason then, in chapter 3 verse 1, he says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ. On behalf of you Gentiles, which by the way, that's most of us in this room. I don't know, maybe you have some Jewish heritage and you can find that and trace that and claim that, but Paul says it's on your behalf, you Gentiles, that I'm a prisoner of Christ, assuming that you heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. 
how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly about it. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and the prophets by his spirit. And I will add that this is the purpose that Paul has, is to communicate that. And that is your purpose also, to communicate, just like Paul, these things. Now, Paul says that he is a prisoner of Christ. Now, literally, if you know the setting and the story and and recall the backdrop of Ephesians, Paul is in Roman, uh, he's under house arrest. There's a Roman guard by him. He talks of his tethering, possibly, even to a Roman guard. He's in prison, (laughs) literally. Now, He says that he is a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he means there is that he has fully surrendered his life to Jesus. And oftentimes we think of this in in negative terms, being in prison. It's not a good thing. But it is a good image for us to recognize as followers of Christ that as disciples of Jesus, we are captivated by him. And he has captivated us in such a way that we recognize and proclaim willingly that we are not our own. It is a willful surrender that leads to greater things, not chains. And so our purpose as Christians, just like Paul's purpose in becoming a Christian uh, and becoming a disciple of Jesus, becoming an, uh, he'll talk about it towards the end of his letter, an ambassador for Christ, it's It's not for his own salvation. So many of the times when we talk about the gospel, when we talk about the proclamation of the gospel, we look at, well, it's about communicating to someone how they've been redeemed, how they can enter into this uh, united relationship with Christ and they can receive salvation. And then we kind of like stop. And we think that's the goal and that's the end. But if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, that's really not the point of your own salvation. John's mentioned that to us a number of times in leadership meetings and in conversations. It's just Maybe he's had conversations with you as an elder. I appreciate that. He's communicated that your salvation is not for you. <laughs> it's for someone else. <laughs> really, Paul's salvation was not for his own salvation, his own benefit. His purpose was to be saved is for the Gentiles. It was for other people. And so when we recognize our purpose and our own salvation, when we receive that gift, that grace, that rich, merciful grace that God has showered upon us and bestowed upon us, we understand that when day theos enters into our lives, we realize and accept that there's a shift that happens in our life. I, I, I think there's, um, there's an analogy that I want to try to associate to this, and it breaks down for sure, but... Prior to marriage, we live for ourselves. <laughs> we don't have to worry about anybody else. Our schedule is our own. Our responsibilities are our own. If we want to go here, we can. If we want to go there, we can. It doesn't matter. We just do whatever we want, right? Now, again, the illustration breaks down. But then we find someone who catches our eye. And like Thumper on Bambi... <laughs> You know, we're (laughs) Twitter-pated, long before Twitter was a thing. Um, (laughs) And and our heart is given to another, and pretty soon we're concerned with their will and their desires, and and maybe even our foot starts to thump just a little bit more. And so everything that we do is kind of geared toward that. And so when we think about becoming a follower of Christ, we understand that God has saved us and redeemed us, and now our lives are not our own. Our lives are given over to another. And and then, well, as as it happens, the two become one. There's this unity thing. God makes the plural singular. And if so blessed, children come to that union. And then, well, there's something else significant that happens, and Your two lives are not just your own. Pretty soon your calendar is crowded with things like early morning diaper changes and feedings and 
It's not your own. <laughs> your life is not your own. <laughs> and then there's schedules at, at ball fields and dance lessons and piano lessons. And there's all these things that begin to consume you and homework and, and help with that. And then dealing with the playground bullies and, and kindness and church activities. And pretty soon life just feels overwhelming, but you're giving yourself to another person to, to raise them and disciple them in the ways of Christ so that they can grow up and know that Jesus is Lord and Savior and that God's not done with them, and he has a great and significant purpose for their lives. We give ourselves as parents to our kids. It's for their benefit that we sacrifice over and over again. And this is what Paul is trying to remind the Ephesians and what he's trying to remind us, that there is others that have captivated our souls and our our lives are not our own anymore. And Paul says, I've become a prisoner for your benefit. And I think through sometimes, well, it's easy to give our lives to our kids, to our grandkids. It's easy to give our lives to a loved one, a spouse. It's harder, much harder for us to give our lives to a stranger, to someone who doesn't fit into our schedule, who doesn't fit into our our, uh, box. (laughs) It's much harder. And yet this is what Paul models for us. That's your purpose. What were you saved for? For someone else. What's your purpose? Somebody else. Oh, that goes countercultural, doesn't it? (laughs) Because everything we read and everything that we are bombarded by, even within the media, even in our voting schedules, vote for me and get what you want. (laughs) Right. We're so caught up in this, and Paul models for us, your life in chains is given over to Christ for someone else so that they might receive salvation and and everything in the heavenly realms, but also so that someone else might know that. Now, Paul says he became a steward of this grace, this mystery, and oftentimes when we look at this word mystery, it is extremely overblown. Um, But he says that his story, his life, is to reveal this mystery. Just a little bit of recap about Paul. Again, Paul is a Jewish scholar. It would have been easy for him uh, to uh, just keep going all about himself. He was trained in the Old Testament scriptures. He kept looking into the mystery that would be fulfilled, the coming Messiah that everyone was looking for. And he knew it wasn't Jesus. That's why he kept putting everyone to death. That's his backstory. This mystery and this this, uh, that he was searching for as a devout Pharisee, it was revealed to him, he declares. In Acts chapter 9, you can read about that. It was revealed to him on the road to Damascus. Very directly, Jesus speaks, why are you persecuting me? And Paul is broken cut to the heart. I'm I'm guessing it doesn't tell us, but he is with the disciples there, and namely Ananias comes and lays his hands on him, and and the scales fall from his eyes, and he spent some time with her. I'm I'm sure that the mystery uh, and the teachings that Jesus taught were passed on to Paul, and Paul is seeing everything in the Old Testament scriptures that he had studied that had been so devout for starting to click. Like, have you ever had that moment? where you're confused and you're in a fog and all of a sudden, oh, it all makes sense now. (laughs) That's what you're talking about. Can you imagine this is Paul? And then there's that moment of just utter terror and horror where he realizes, oh, (laughs) I've been fighting against it and I have done some pretty dramatic things like putting people to death. You don't just undo that. You just can't like, oops, sorry, (laughs) take that back. I mean, can you imagine Paul going and knocking on the door of some widow and saying, I'm sorry for the death of your husband because I was wrong? Uh, This is what Paul's 
experience and backdrop is, this mystery of the gospel, that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament scriptures, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Savior of the world. The how that happens, it's all made clear to him. This mystery. The word is mysterion. Makes sense. It's kind of like those Spanish words that you're like, I don't know how to say it, but if I just put like a some type of Spanish flair to it, maybe it'll be close. And then somebody who knows Spanish looks at you and laughs because they know you have no clue what you're talking about. The mystery here, uh, mysterion is the Greek word. It implies a knowledge withheld. Uh, again, our backdrop to the Ephesians, the ancient Greeks, they had lots of mysteries. Their religious rites and ceremonies, they practiced secret rituals and secret societies. And if someone wanted to become part of it, then they were initiated into these mysteries. That's where we get the word mystical. And so if someone wanted to be part of it and they wanted to understand it more, they had to empty themselves and they had to become uh, just clearly all in. And they spent some time just studying it and really opening themselves up to evil spirits. They practiced witchery and and magic arts, child sacrifice. This was the culture's understanding of the mystery. In the scriptures, uh, we understand that mystery is an insight made available to Christians, which was not made clear in the Old Testament. Paul says that this mystery has been made clear to me, it's, and my goal and my purpose, my calling has been to make clear this mystery to you. It, God doesn't want this secret. It's not a secret society that we're part of. He wants everybody to know clearly, and it's very simple what he's trying to communicate to us. God makes the plural singular. All the prophets, they pointed to Christ. All the apostles, they pointed back to Christ. They taught about what Jesus said. And this mystery, this thing that we think is some mystical thing that is hard to understand, that we can't wrap our minds around, it's told to us plainly in verse 6 of chapter 3. Here it is, the big secret. It's that Gentiles are fellow heirs. They're members of the same body. They're partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That same promise that was made to Abraham and Isaac and all through the generations that pointed to Jesus Christ. This, that God was doing a work to make the plural single, that all people would become one in Christ. That's it. It's real mysterious, isn't it? This is what everyone had been searching for, and, and for generations, they just couldn't, they couldn't see it. And in Jesus' day, there were many that denied it, and they couldn't, they couldn't grasp it, and they were, they were in denial. And, oh, it can't be that way. Nothing good comes from Nazareth. This is the carpenter's son. It can't be him. And Paul, he understands. And yet it's so scandalous, <laughs> this Jewish culture, this Jewish people who took such pride in who they were being special and holy people before God, the select few. God just lets everybody in? <laughs> yes. I mean, if you're here today and you're, you're kind of wondering, like, oh, I'm not a proud person or... Do I need this Jesus person? Do I want to be part of the church? I want you to hear very clearly that God has made a way for everyone to become one in Christ, to be accepted into the church. You don't have to have a status, a bank account. It doesn't matter. He loves you. God sent his son to be the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies, to be our redeemer, our savior, to save us from something that we can't save ourselves from, our own sin, our own fallings, our shortcomings, so that we might have the hope of eternity and we might spend eternity with him, but that's not the end because he wants all people to know this truth so that all might be one in Christ, so that none might perish because if we're not in him, We're destined to the gates of hell, the fires of hell. 
This is not a scare tactic. That's just what the word says. Paul says, this is my purpose, to make known this mystery. And it's your purpose. Whether you're a welder, a farmer, a teacher, a parent, a dishwasher, car salesman, it doesn't matter what you do. This is your purpose. This is what you were created for, to make known this mystery. Verse 7, he says, of this gospel, I was made a minister. Don't get caught up on titles. It's just deacon is the word, the Greek word. It means servant. It's used a lot of times in Acts. He was made a servant according to the gift of God's grace. Just like you were made a servant according to the gift of God's grace, which was given by the working of his power. You and I, we've been made servants and prisoners where we willingly say, Lord, yes, these chains, they're not chains that tie me, but they're chains that free me. And I don't, it seems like a weird concept, but that's why I believe the scriptures talk about how it is just confusing to the outside world that we would be willing to embrace chains because we understand those chains actually free us, not bind us. That's confusing, but that's the truth. Our purpose is to make known this mystery. God has purposed you to this calling. And sometimes, though, we can feel a little elevated, just like the Jews, though, and become a little prideful about how we're chosen and Yet Paul had a very good perspective. We didn't, we, it doesn't show all of this progression, but in Paul's life, he had it all put together, right? In the beginning when he was a good Pharisee, studied underneath Gamaliel. I mean, he was in the right line, the right teacher, had the right track, up and to the right, successful power, influence. It was all his. So confident, putting Christians to death. De theos happens, and here he says, you can see the humility. He says, but I am the very least of all the saints. And who are the saints? Just all the Christians. It's not some special title. It's those who God has called, those who God has redeemed. This grace was given for the purpose to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is a language that is used here. The unsearchable richness of Christ. Do you know Christ that way? Do you know him as as the God who is beyond our description, rich, beyond our ability to comprehend the unsearchable richness, the riches of Christ, and to bring to light for, what's the word at church? Everyone. Everyone. What is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms? This This is the word I want you to underline. I want you to see it very clearly. It's there in verse 10. Sometimes we think it's my responsibility, right? I'm the preacher. I get to teach. Um, sometimes we, oh, it's, el- it's the elders. It's their job. It's Mark's job. <laughs> He's qualified. Uh, it says, so that through, I'm going to use the word who? The church. That's you. That is me. That's the elders. But just comprehend this for a moment. <laughs> it's not just through mega preachers, <laughs> mega church preachers, that the truth is communicated, that the light of the world has come, that the light that breaks forth in darkness and shines and chases away the darkness in life. It's not just through them. It's not through some author or book that you read. It's not through some uh, scholar who writes a commentary. It's through 
you. It's through us that God makes known the manifold wisdom. And no, that's not an exhaust pipe. <laughs> the manifold wisdom, the just the, the so big, so rich, so exciting wisdom, the unsearchable richness of Christ and his mercy and his grace, the forgiveness that he has bestowed, it's through us that he makes us known. And so when we ask the question, who am I and what was I created to do, the answer is right there. Individually and collectively, we are purposed and equipped to make known the manifold wisdom of God both to rulers and authorities, even in the heavenly places. That's our purpose. And so I just want to think of it in simple ways. Who can you make known the manifold witness of God today? Who can you make known the manifold witness of God tomorrow? How can you make it known we have red chairs in the room in case you're new with us. It's to remind us of our purpose. It's to remind us that there's those that are far off from God and his desires that he wants all to be brought near and that we have been called for a purpose to make known the manifold wisdom of God. And verse 11 and following, it says, And this was according to the eternal purpose that, has, that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our, in our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is for your glory. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes, what do you think about the words boldness and confidence? Is that your perspective when you're getting ready to tell somebody who's a coworker? let me tell you about the manifold witness of God, <laughs> the wisdom of God. <laughs> Is it filled with boldness and confidence? Now, here's what I would say. Try to phrase that in a way that engages a conversation and not like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> what are you even trying to get at? Sometimes it's, it's those small little conversations where God has called us to be bold and to be confident through our faith in him, to trust in him, even if we might suffer. Because <laughs> that's what Paul's reminding us, that he's in prison because he has boldly proclaimed the gospel. He has boldly proclaimed what Christ has done. I want to challenge us to that same response. For Paul, what he is facing, the suffering, this imprisonment, he doesn't want us to be discouraged because of it. In fact, he wants us to be encouraged by it. And he models for us the same calling. For brothers and sisters across the, the seas, this is what they're facing. And they have boldness. And they have confidence. And I call us to that same level. This is, this is our calling and this is, this is our purpose. This mystery is not something that is cloaked, that we cannot see, that we cannot understand. It's been made clear. It's simply the gospel. That God has sent his son so that all might become one in him. Now, it seems a pretty... Uh, elementary message, but over and over and over again, that's what the scriptures teach us, over and over. And yet, it's like the, the preacher that came, and they were trying to see if they wanted to hire him, so he preached a sermon, and then, you've probably heard this, and so the next week, they, they hired him, and he came back, and he preached the same sermon, and two, and three, and four weeks go by, and he preaches the same sermon each time, and finally, the elders call him back and say, you're going to have to come up with something different. He said, that's great. I'll come up with something different. But the message is still going to be the same because God's word is still the same. And 
When we start doing, well, now I can go on to move two, <laughs> to step two. And God has challenged us and purposed us. He has saved us not for our own salvation, but so that we might, like Paul, declare the mystery of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God. And so if you're here today and you're trying to figure out, like, who is Jesus? Who is, do, do I, do I, what do I do with this information? What is sin? I don't even know if I have it. We want, to, we want to have these conversations to look at God's word. There's a whole bunch of lists. I don't care about the list, but our, our heart needs to be surrendered to God, trusting in him. And then our purpose after that is to go with the gospel. That's why as a mission statement as a church here, you'll see that we gather as the body of Christ uh, so that we might grow in the gospel of Christ to be equipped to go with that gospel of Christ to make a difference, to proclaim the mysteries of God, the hope of God. And so when we walk out these doors, I want you to think, who? Who am I going to share? Uh, there's a connect card in your seat back pocket. Maybe there's a way that you can plug in and you can engage in, a, in an active area of ministry by shaking a hand when you come in. You can edify the body. By running a soundboard or a computer, you can edify and help the church accomplish its goal and, and mission. And by sitting in the nursery, you can minister to those families that use that service. By leading some study or being a part of it, you can communicate and, and encourage one another. There's so many things that you can do. So if you want to fill out that card and find out where can I be of service, I'd love to have a conversation with you. If you're new with us and you've never filled that out, uh, we just want to connect with you. You can drop that in the offering box on your way out, uh, or you can hand it to me. Um, we'd love to get you know, to know you better so you can become part of the body of Christ here um, so that also, you might know the hope of salvation, if that's not your hope, if you don't know that for sure. And so whatever your step is, I encourage you to take it uh, this week. Allow God to stir in your heart a name of someone that you can be a minister to. I'm going to invite you to stand and pray. I'm going to close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time together to study your word to, to know very clearly the mystery that has eluded generations before us is, is plain and simple. Your son is the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament prophecies pointed to. That he came, he died, he rose again for my sin and shame. Not just so that I can be saved, but so that others also might know the rich merciful, unsearchable wisdom of God. Thank you, Father. Lead us as we go to accomplish your will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.